Studies in the Gospel of Mark. W. J. Hawking. 35. Marshalling into Order. 1914-90 No Spectacle, perhaps, exhibits greater disorder and confusion than a crowd of excited persons. Such a concourse is described most graphically in the reference to the mob assembled in the theater at Ephesus, which cried for the space of two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. We read of them that, some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together, Acts 19 verse 32. A multitude has no conscience to condemn the wrong, and no humane consideration for the weak. Many an outrage has been wrought by a hungry mob in a struggle for food. When the famished people of Samaria thronged out of the gates in quest of the food left in the deserted tents of the Syrians, they trod to death the supercilious captain who was set there to regulate the traffic. The Lord would not permit any such confusion. He was preparing a table in the wilderness for these Galilean folk, and he arranged the guests according to a definite plan. He would have no haste, no disorder. He himself knew what he would do. He commanded the assembled thousands to be seated as at table, not where they would, but where and how he would. He was the Lord of the feast, and he would say, say to one, sit here, and to another, sit there, as it pleased him. The mass of persons was divided systematically by him according to a simple plan which all could understand and follow. The men were to sit in one place, and the women and children in another by themselves. They were disposed in companies and ranks, in fifties, counting in one direction, and in rows of hundreds, counting in another, fifty hundreds, making five thousand, so far as the men were concerned. Such an arrangement obviated confusion, and enabled the distribution of the bread and the fish to be made with equal fairness to all, while the task of distribution was made less laborious for the disciples. Even under these circumstances, considerable physical exertion was involved in handling the amount of food required to satisfy the hunger of all the company. Assuming for the purpose of making a rough estimate that each person present ate one pound of bread, more than two and a quarter tons would be necessary for the men, omitting all provision for the women and children, and making no allowance for the fish, nor for the fragments that remained at the close of the meal. These items would increase the total weight beyond three tons. There was therefore a considerable bulk of food for the twelve apostles to handle. See note. Note, may we not believe that the whole bulk of the food was handled by the Lord himself? Though it is idle to speculate as to the exact point where the multiplication took place, whether in the hands of the Lord, Lord, or in those of the apostles. End of note. The prearranged system materially lightened the labor incurred, and moreover enabled the people to take their meal without distraction. Looking back to the occasion of the Lord leaving Capernaum to come to this spot, we see that the unjealous Lord protected his guests from such interruptions and disturbances as those which prevented him and his apostles from eating their food in peace, and which led him to seek seclusion in the wilderness. The Lord's Fellow Helpers When they were all seated in orderly array upon the green grass, for it was the springtime, and the herbage of the hillside was shooting up in young and beautiful life, the Lord took up the five loaves and the two fishes, their size being such that he could probably hold them all at once. In the presence of the assembled multitude he raised his eyes to heaven, as he did when he healed the deaf and dumb man, Mark 7 verse 34, and when he came to the grave of Lazarus, John 11 verse 41. This was an attitude of prayer and heavenly communion, John 17 verse 1, and he had taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, assuring them at the same time that the heavenly Father who feeds the birds of the air would not forget his more valuable creatures. By this act the perfect servant sets an example before all, acknowledging his dependence upon the one who sent him, and in general effect taking up the language of the psalmist, Unto thee do I lift up mine eyes, O thou that sittest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their master, as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look unto the Lord our God until he have mercy upon us, Psalm 123 verses 1 to 2. The Lord also blessed. In John 6. 2 we read that he gave thanks. Luke says that he blessed the loaves and fishes, Luke 9 verse 16, while Matthew and Mark speak only of blessing without naming the object. In scriptural usage, blessing and the giving of thanks are closely joined. Both terms are used in connection with the Lord's Supper, example blessing, Mark 14 verse 22, 
1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, and giving thanks, Mark 14 verse 23, Luke 22 verse 19, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 24. To bless, eulogio, seems to combine, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 16, the ascription of praise and thanks to God with the sanctification of food for healthful use, 1 Timothy 4 verses 4 to 5. The host then broke the victuals, and the distribution began with him. The multiplication and the extent of it were altogether in his hands. Under his superintendence, the little did not become less. He opened his hand and supplied the need of every living person before him. Twas springtide when he blessed the bread. Twas harvest when he brake. But the disciples were made sharers in this benefaction, which they had not been able to anticipate. He gave of the loaves and the fishes to them to set before the people. It was the Lord's part to bless the provision abundantly, and to satisfy these poor folks with bread, Psalm 132 verse 15. But while the apostles could not multiply the five loaves into a bounty for five thousand men, they could transport the bounty as it accumulated to the hungry mouths of their brothers in Israel. This service they were called to perform under their master's eye, and it was analogous to their subsequent spiritual service as the fellow laborers of God, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. The apostles, though forming the foundation of the church, were never origina originators. They acted in the name of the Lord. As with the physical, so with the spiritual food, what they received of the Lord, they delivered to others, either for their physical or their spiritual nutrition, just as the case was, the Spirit, in the latter case, dividing to each one severally according to his will, 1 Corinthians 12. 11. The Overflowing Bounty. James, writing of the giver of wisdom, says he giveth to all liberally, and upbraideth not. Another contemplating his great riches of goodness, says, of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. A transcendent generousness is the divine habit. Hence we read that at this feast in the wilderness, they did all eat and were filled. Not one was overlooked. The weak women and children were not crowded off by selfish men, but all were supplied with an ample sufficiency, of which they were able to partake with ease and comfort as they sat upon the green grass. Philip's way would have been to provide enough bread for the meal, so that each might take a little, the Lord's way was to provide a superabundance, so that everyone might have as much as he would. We may not regard the superfluity as the result of a too liberal estimate on the part of the Lord. He who increased the scanty store by his omnipotence, knew, in his omniscience, the exact measure of the appetites of the multitude. But he did not stay the exercise of his multiplying power at that point. He gave them good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Was he not showing forth the Father, and the plenty of his house, where there is surely bread enough and to spare? He was, as it were, opening the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing, and there was not room enough to receive it. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth, says the proverb, and there was an exemplification of it that day. The abundance was such, that they were able at the close of the meal to gather together for future consumption twelve basketfuls of the portions which the Lord had bro broken off and divided. When Jehovah multiplied the widow's oil in the days of Elisha there was sufficient, when sold, to pay her debts, and also something for her to go on with. The same Lord was here, and was spreading before these weary and hungry Galileans the largest of heaven. The very profusion of the gifts marked that they came from above. And the same feature of amplitude is true of spiritual things as of temporal, for where sin abounded, grace did superabound. Oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God! The Lesson of Frugality The Lord who exhibited such plentitude in the provisions he spread before the multitude gave special directions for the care of such overplus as would be found when all needs were met. It is from John only of the four evangelists that we learn of Jesus saying to his disciples, Gather up the broken pieces which remain over, that nothing be lost, John 6 verse 12. That nothing be lost. The Lord would not have us lose his gifts by waste or neglect because we have more than sufficient for the moment. When God gave seven years of plenty in Egypt, it was the spirit of divine wisdom in Joseph that devised efficient measures to gather up the superabundance and store it for the days of famine. Nothing was to be lost. When the people of Israel reached the land of Canaan, the Lord promised, in view of the rest of the sabbatic year, that he would command his blessing during the sixth year so that the land might bring forth fruit sufficient for three years, Leviticus 25 verse 21. 
But of what value would this abundance be to the nation if the bounteous harvest was not carefully garnered? Again, we observe that in spite of profusion nothing was to be lost. In short, the lesson is one of general application. It is not pleasing to God that we should neglect or squander his bounties. To waste is to despise, to lose, his gifts. Economy is not contrary to, but consistent with true liberality, and thrift with benevolence and benefaction. That person who lays by in store as God has prospered him, is the person who is thereby prepared to bestow his gifts bountifully when occasion arises, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2. The superabundant broken pieces were those which the Lord had broken off for distribution, and of these each apostle had a basketful over and above what was required by the people. The whole scene is eloquent of the rich goodness of God, provided by the servant of Jehovah, and administered by the twelve apostles. It recalls the words of Paul written to the Corinthian believers, God is able to make all grace abound unto you, that ye, having all sufficiency in everything may abound unto every good work, being enriched in everything unto all liberality which worketh out through us thanksgiving to God, 2 Corinthians 9 verses 8-11.